Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and Mrs. Reagan. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have with us this morning the President of the United States and the First Lady. Mrs. Reagan has fought this battle against illegal drugs during all her years in the White House. She has traveled tirelessly around our country, logging over 200,000 miles, sharing her vision of a drug-free America. And it's hard to know sometimes the individual impact of our efforts. I want to tell you, Mrs. Reagan, that everywhere I went, youngsters would rush up to me to tell me, I met Mrs. Reagan. She talked to me. She told me how bad drugs are. You have touched millions of lives. They have heard your message, and they will not forget your graciousness and inspiration in bringing it to them. Mr. President, it has been my great honor to serve you and your efforts to meet the concerns of crime victims, to balance the interests of justice, and to combat the threat of illegal drugs. The essence of leadership is integrity, a virtue you possess in abundance. <laughs> this nation has been blessed to have a leader of your character, your sensitivity, and your concern at its helm. And when the record is written, it will reflect that drawing upon your own values, you gave America back its sense of pride and purpose. Ladies and gentlemen, the President. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lois. And let me just say here how much Nancy and I admire the job that Lois has been doing. On my desk in the Oval Office, I have a little sign that says, there is no limit to what a man can do or where he can go if he doesn't mind who gets the credit. And I can't think of anyone who's a better example of that truth about quietly getting things done than Lois Harrington. <laughs> Lois, I speak for everyone here in saying thanks for the great job that you do. 
All of us are here today to, all of us to talk about the campaign for a drug-free America. Now, I've said this once or twice in public and many times at home, but I can't say it too often. There are a few things that I'm more proud of than the work that Nancy has done in the fight against drugs. And in a moment, I'll talk about money and law enforcement and so forth. They're important, no doubt. But Nancy has addressed something more fundamental. She's touched the conscience and consciousness of the nation. She's helped teach hundreds of thousands of our young people to just say no to drugs and alcohol. Nancy, I'm so proud, and I'll confess that I've been nursing a little guilt, too. I'm the only one in the family the government's paying. Uh, we're, we're fighting the crusade for a drug-free America on many fronts. In the past seven years, we've, for the first time ever, set up a coordinated federal, state, and local campaign against drug smugglers. Among other things, we've enlisted the military in the battle including Navy ships and AWAC planes. We've also set up 13 federal, state, and local strike forces to investigate and prosecute major drug rings. We've substantially increased the number of federal prosecutors and agents, and we've strengthened the laws so that, for example, we can now dispose of property that was bought with drug money. We don't have to give it back. The results? Last year, federal drug agents confiscated over half a billion dollars worth of drug-related assets. They closed down 682 clandestine laboratories, and they seized 92,000 pounds of cocaine. These are all records. We've taken fleets of airplanes, boats, and trucks from smugglers and dealers. I visited Florida some time back and saw for the first time what $20 million looks like. It was piled up on a table confiscated from drug dealers. I've heard stories of our planes tracking drug planes and landing right behind them on the runways, agents jumping out and making the arrest. To get around us, smugglers have had to find new ways of hiding their product. We've discovered drugs in hollowed out lumber and in bathrooms and luggage compartments in airplanes. One morning in Tennessee, a man woke up and found a body in his driveway. It was wearing an unopened parachute and carried a large package of cocaine. An air smuggler had tried to elude pursuers by bailing out of his plane. Drug seizures are at an all-time high. Federal drug arrests have increased 66 percent. Arrests of major traffickers have tripled. And in the past eight years, prison sentences for those convicted of drug law violations have increased by 44 percent to an average of more than six years per sentence. And that's how we're fighting on what you might call the supply side of the crusade against drugs. But as significant as stopping smugglers and pushers is, ending the demand for drugs is how, in the end, we'll win. That's why the best news I've heard. That's why the best news I've heard in a long time was the recently released annual survey of high school seniors. For 13 years, we have asked thousands of graduating seniors what drugs they use, how often, and what they think about drug abuse. For the first time, a substantially smaller proportion of the seniors, one-third smaller, acknowledged current cocaine use than did the year before. Use of marijuana and amphetamines is also dropping. Better still, almost all students said it was wrong even to try a drug like cocaine. With all the headlines about how we're losing the drug war, let's keep in mind the progress we've made. Many drug-related problems now are not because more people are turning to drugs. In fact, the number of users has leveled off and may be falling but because so many got hooked when the message went out that illegal drugs were acceptable. This conference couldn't have happened eight years ago. Not enough people cared. Now, almost everyone cares. Your communities are looking to you for leadership. So let me ask you to take back home the message that illegal drugs are one thing no community in America
can, should, or needs to tolerate in schools, in workplaces, in the streets, anywhere. America's already starting to take that message to heart. That's why I believe the tide of battle has turned and we're beginning to win the crusade for a drug-free America. Now, rather than go any further, I'll stop here. President Eisenhower once said that the great thing about this job was no one could tell you to sit down. <laughs> well, almost no one. Nancy, you're on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> I know who's boss in the family. I can't tell you how good it feels to be here at this conference with so many people united in a common purpose. Although the drug problem is still destructive, the nation has come a long way in its battle against drugs, and your presence here today proves it. At least we realize there is a drug problem today. In Saturday's Washington Post, there was one page in which every article was a local drug story. And there was another local drug story on the front page. We must face the fact that drugs are tearing our communities apart. Although I've been deeply concerned about this problem since my days in Sacramento, over the past nearly eight years, I focused mainly on education, on prevention, and on the need to change attitudes. Although we're making progress, still many ignorant ideas persist. And one of the worst is the casual user's justification that drug use is a victimless crime, that drugs don't hurt anyone except the person who's using them. Yet there are consequences to drug use beyond an individual's personal and selfish high. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about this morning. A few weeks ago, the drug cartel murdered Colombia's Attorney General, Carlos Moro Hoyas, who was active in trying to halt cocaine traffic to the United States. Half a dozen men in three Jeeps ran his car into a curb, sprayed it with machine gun fire, and killed his two bodyguards. Mr. Hoyas was later found blindfolded and handcuffed, his skull shattered with bullets. And ladies and gentlemen, the the people who casually use cocaine are responsible because their money bought those bullets. <laughs> they provided the high stakes that murdered those men, plus hundreds of others in Colombia, including Supreme Court justices, 21 judges handling drug cases, and scores of policemen and soldiers. The notion that the mellow marijuana user doesn't hurt anyone is just as phony. As a result of an intensive effort by the Drug Enforcement Administration in Guadalajara, Mexico, and particularly Special Agent Enrique Camarena, over 10,000 acres of marijuana that were ready for harvest and eventual sale in the United States were destroyed. And this caused a major financial loss for a notorious trafficking group. On February 7, 1985, less than three months after the destruction of the 10,000-acre plantation, Special Agent Camarena was kidnapped by the traffickers. He was tortured and beaten to death. And this country's casual marijuana users cannot escape responsibility for their fellow Americans' death because they, in effect, bought the tools for his torture. As you know, many others have had their lives taken to protect our society from the corruption of drugs. Two DEA agents in California were killed just this month. Last week, while guarding the home of a witness in a drug crime, a rookie policeman in New York was assassinated in a patrol car. The traffickers and dealers will murder anyone who stands in their way. 
Recently, an innocent young girl in Los Angeles was shot to death in the crossfire between two rival drug gangs. Now, who will tell the grief-stricken families that drug use is a victimless crime? The casual user may think when he takes a line of cocaine or smokes a joint in the privacy of his nice condo, listening to his expensive stereo, that he's somehow not bothering anyone. But there's a trail of death and destruction that leads directly to his door. The casual user cannot morally escape responsibility for the action of drug traffickers and dealings. I'm saying that if you're a casual drug user, you're an accomplice to murder. Casual user, you also cannot morally escape association with those who use drugs and then endanger the public safety. The message from casual use is that drugs are acceptable, that they can be handled, that somehow it's simply a matter of dosage. Casual use sets the tone for tolerance, and that tolerance has killed. Anne and Arthur Johnson are from Potomac, Maryland. They're with us today, and I'll introduce you to them later. On January 4th, 1987, the Johnson's daughter, 20-year-old Christy, was taking the train to New York to visit her sister before heading back to classes at Stanford University. The Sunday afternoon Amtrak train was crowded with students returning to school and families returning home from Christmas and the New Year holidays. Unknown to the passengers, a Conrail locomotive passed several warning signals and crossed into the path of the Amtrak train. The crash killed 16 innocent people and injured 175 others. Christy never made it to her sisters. She was killed in the crash. The investigation determined that the engineer and brakeman on the Conrail train were smoking marijuana prior to the crash. 16 people killed because of an engineer's personal indulgence in a joint of marijuana. Now, don't tell the Johnsons that casual drug use is a victimless crime. And don't try to tell the Johnsons that drug hurt, drugs hurt no one but the user. Several of the families of the victims were, who were killed in the wreck testified before the Senate last week in favor of mandatory drug testing for railroad personnel. The engineer and the brakeman also called for such testing saying that alcohol and drug use was widespread within the industry. Senator Danforth told the families, you won't win this quickly. You have to fan the flame of rage. And that's exactly what we must do. We must fan the flame of rage. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to make it impossible for casual users to escape responsibility for any innocent death due to drugs. I want to make them fully face the brutality of drug use. I don't mind admitting that I have reservations about telling the following two stories because they're real stories of anguish and inhuman brutality. Yet Betty Jean Spencer and Vince and Roberta Roper can't ignore the brutality of drugs. They live with it every day. They're with us today, and if they can't forget, neither should we. First, let me tell you about Betty Jean Spencer. Mrs. Spencer was at home in her rural farmhouse in Indiana with her four sons. They were 14, 16, 18, and 22 years old. Four men barged into the house, men out on bail on drug trafficking. The men didn't know her. They didn't know her sons. Mrs. Spencer says they were obviously high on something. They were laughing about the other people they were going to kill when they finished there. They ordered Mrs. Spencer and her four sons to line up face down on the floor, and then the men began shooting them at point-blank range with a shotgun. Mrs. Spencer miraculously survived two shotgun blasts to the back of her head, but her sons were murdered, and the men are in prison. That's a brutal, brutal story, and it makes me angry. 
And no one, absolutely no one, should be allowed to say that drug use is a victimless crime. No one should be able to get away with the argument that drugs are a harmless, private indulgence. Finally, let me tell you about the nightmare that Vince and Roberta Roper must endure. Their daughter, Stephanie, a 22-year-old student, was returning to school in Maryland when her car broke down. Two men offered assistance. They drove her a short distance in their car, pulled a gun on her, and each raped her. They drove to another location and raped her again. They then decided to kill her. I don't want to repeat what they did to her, but we can't ignore the brutality of drugs. One of the men whipped Stephanie on the head with a chain, and as she tried to run away, he shot her. He then poured gasoline on her and set fire to her. Both men were users of PCP, LSD, amphetamines, barbiturates, virtually any drug they could obtain. Now, who would dare stand before the Ropers and tell them that drug use is a victimless crime? What apologist for casual drug use will look the Ropers in the eye and say, it's all a matter of moderation? Who could be so brazen? Yet the attitude prevails. Applause isn't appropriate, but a hug or a squeeze of the hand when you leave might mean a lot. But I'd like to introduce you to Betty Jean Spencer, and Anne and Arthur Johnson, Vincent and Roberta Roper, Thank you. Let's each of us help here help promise them that we won't let anyone forget the brutality of drugs. You know, in the field of drug and alcohol abuse, there's something called the enabling concept. If I don't do something about your behavior, then I enable it to happen. Society's attitude has enabled the casual drug user to avoid facing his role in the murder and brutality behind drugs. We can no longer let the casual user continue without paying the moral penalty. We must be absolutely unyielding and inflexible in our opposition to drug use. There's no middle ground. We must be as adamant about the casual user as we are about the addict. And whereas the addict deserves our help, the casual user deserves our condemnation because he could easily stop, and yet he chooses not to do so. He must be made to feel the burden of brutality and corruption for which he's ultimately responsible. And we must get the message out. We will not stand for illicit drug use of any kind, period. And there's another message I'd like to get out to all of you here today, and that's a message of gratitude for your involvement in the fight against drugs. You're the people who will eventually turn the tide. You're the ones who will make the difference. Many of you have been with me from the very beginning in one capacity or another, and I want you to know that when my husband and I returned to California, I'm not giving up my interest and concern about this. <laughs> you can't get rid of me. <laughs> in fact, I'll be actively involved in the Nancy Reagan Center in Los Angeles to be run by Phoenix House. The center will include a residential high school for young people in treatment, a training unit, and a research unit. I hope that the center will become a place where we can develop new methods, test new approaches, and discover new answers. Anne Morrow Lindbergh once wrote, one can never pay in gratitude. One can only pay in kind somewhere else in life. And I'm hoping that this center will be one way I may repay all of you for the support and love and encouragement you've given me over the past eight years. Thank you for your support, and thank you for what you're doing for our nation.
Thank you, President and Mrs. Reagan, for getting us off to the right start. And we won't let you down. Hello, Mr. President and Mrs. Reagan. Oh, my God. What a thrill for all of us to be here in your presence. But a dream come true for me and my family. You see, we travel around the country making people laugh. And four years ago, I said no to drugs. And almost two years now, it's been since I wrote this song. And I think we need an anthem for your fight, Mrs. Reagan. And I think, I just think, this is it. God bless you and our president. Our country loves you.
Now the words are easy enough. Come on, people. Let's hear the bass. Let's hear the bass and sing it. We'll have a Thank you, Frankie Shintus, and your terrific family, and thank your station, WKBW, from Buffalo, New York, for making sure this went around the country. And President and Mrs. Reagan, <laughs> President and Mrs. Reagan, thank you for sharing this with us and getting this off to such a great start. Thank <laughs> you. 